to increase parental awareness, retail enforcement, and advertising best practices, and I salute you for that. The agency found that nearly 9 in 10 parents are aware of the rating system that cut the number of minors who could purchase M-rated games nearly in half. These findings support my view that the industry is taking responsibility for the product it makes and gives parents the support and tools they need to make informed decisions about what games come into their homes. Regarding the media industry as a whole, there has been an explosion of options available to consumers. We've gone from three networks and PBS to hundreds of channels of diverse content. The main complaint these days is that there's too much to choose from, rather than not enough. However, among all of the available content options, there are definitely things that I don't care for. I'm pleased that the industry has created a rating system that offers parents more information so they can block degrading images from their kids. There should be a far greater effort to teach parents how to use these controls on their televisions. There is truly something for everyone among the hundreds of channels and iPods and satellite radio programs and DVDs. So watch what you like and don't wa watch what you don't like. That is a pretty simple theory. As for as lyrics and adult content are concerned, it is a cultural conversation and we need to be careful not to look like we're advocating censorship of artists whose creative expressions reflect their lives and experiences. They have had those things of what shapes our young people's lives and experiences and forced them to think. I'm pleased that we have two successful artists here today to tell their stories. Let us make certain that we Respect those important freedoms. This is complicated subject matter. And the most important thing we can do is convene these forms and engage in a serious civil conversation that heightens everyone's sensitivities to the problem. Not the problem of rap music, but the problems facing our communities each and every day. This is not about legislating or pointing fingers at any anyone. It is about a serious, thoughtful dialogue, and I thank you all for furthering the national debate in this forum, and it's really about working together to see in terms of what we might be able to do, because you admit, and I admit, that there is a problem. On that note, Mr. Chairman, I almost yield back, but I'm out of time, so I can't yield anything back. <laughs> well, thank you, gentlemen. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Pitts, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll submit my entire statement for the record, but uh, I'd like to make a few points. Uh, first of all, thank you for holding this important hearing, and thank you for your leadership on this issue. It's very much appreciated. A number of the images and actions, profanity, and overall messages promoted by the music and entertainment industries today are deeply disturbing. Violence, devaluation of life, degradation of women permeate much of the visual and vocal products circulating in our marketplace. What people see and hear absolutely does affect them. And that's why marketers spend billions of dollars every year on media advertising. They know that people, particularly kids, internalize what they see and hear, especially when they see and hear it over and over. Companies are in business to make a profit. That is clear. But is it only when there is a public outcry, for example, over lead-tainted toys, that companies make changes? Or look at cigarette production. It took a long time for cigarette companies to admit that nicotine was addictive, despite a plethora of scientific evidence, because they did not want to admit the health risk associated with their lucrative products. In terms of degradation in music, videos and other forms of entertainment. Sadly, profanity and violence do seem to sell well. Tragically, when a product promotes violence, it does impact individuals' lives, and community lives, even our nation's life. Take Columbine, for example. 
We know that the young men who took other students' lives listened to very violent music. One of the songs they listened to repeats six times in one song. Quote, if I had a shotgun, I'd blow myself straight to hell. Close quote. If a child listens over and over and over to lyrics of a song, the message begins to sink in and becomes part of the perspective through which he or she views life. In addition to violence in general, a deeply disturbing message promoted by certain songs and videos treats women as objects, not people. These images foster an environment that, that can be permissive in terms of attitudes of domestic violence against women. Domestic violence statistics in our nation are horrible, and incidents of violence cross all sectors and economic levels of society. According to the University of Minnesota's Human Rights Library, quote, domestic violence also contributes to other forms of violence against women. Women who experience violence at home may be more willing to look for and accept an uncertain and potentially risky job abroad, placing them in danger of being trafficked, close quote. In 2004, there was a briefing on Capitol Hill focusing on domestic trafficking and sexual exploitation. The main panelists were not adult experts, but were five young women from various backgrounds who had lived through years of abuse, both at home and on the streets, from pimps, police officers, foster care, and others. Even after receiving assistance, the girls were afraid to testify against the pimps who had caused such great harm in their lives because the men would only get six months in prison. The girls all knew of others who had testified but who had been beaten up afterwards or even killed. Basically, pimps are sex traffickers. Unfortunately, the music messages we're discussing today promote domestic violence and trafficking in humans. Mr. Chairman, I strongly believe that the responsibility for messages promoted in a particular music album, music video, video game, or the like lies at all stages of development and production. Artists, managers, producers, sales representatives, upper level management, and CEOs all bear culpability for the messages that are promoted and affect our youth. There are those performers who are taking a stand to help stop promoting negative messages to our youth. I applaud them. I also commend our distinguished witness, Mr. Percy Miller, on his efforts to produce albums with positive message. We need more individuals like these. I look forward to hearing from our distinguished witnesses. Now, you'll back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey, for five minutes. I thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I commend you for this most welcome inquiry and discussion. Whether it's rap or hip-hop or any other musical genre, it is vital that artists can freely express their talent and convey their messages. This is true of any art form. The spectrum of what it is to be human, what the experience may be for a particular person at this time in history, in whatever circumstances they find themselves, discovers flowering and expression in art. This should be celebrated and revered, even if such art or messages occasionally make people uncomfortable. What our popular mass media does, however, is to take certain artists' works and essentially put them on steroids. Quite often, the art that is marketed and sold reflect the personal experiences of artists, their neighborhoods, and their understanding of the world in which they've grown up. On the other hand, some of the art that is chosen by large commercial companies for marketing back into such neighborhoods has the power to reinforce messages and bestow acceptability upon themes, actions, and words that no parent and no community leader would ever deign to endorse. Such products can be mean and degrading, and repeated over and over again represent an incessant undermining of human dignity. It was brought into focus most recently for me by comments made by former NBA star Isaiah Thomas. In a taped video, Isaiah Thomas said that if a white male referred to a white female by a vulgar term, it would be highly offensive. 
If a white male referred to a black female by the same term, it would also be highly offensive. But if a black male referred to a black female by the same vulgar term, Isaiah Thomas said it wasn't so bad. That is repugnance because he is such a role model for so many young people in our country. What a hideous double standard he is promoting. This hearing is tapping into something that is long overdue. Like Isaiah Thomas's comments, the subjects for this hearing indicate a moral failing. What responsibility do media companies exercise when they select artists and songs and videos to promote and to mass distribute? I remember when BET was launched. It was supposed to be the black, sophisticated, educational and entertainment channel, full of high-minded bear evoking the best of the Harlem Renaissance and the great diversity of the community. Instead, it became the lowest common denominator of cheap and tawdry music videos and other questionable programs. I was encouraged to see today's article about some of the new programming BBT will be putting out. That's wonderful. But frankly, it has a long way to go to make up for such uh, a long history of previous programming. And I understand that the music industry is prepared to make its rating system more useful to parents by implementing a mechanism whereby parents can block inappropriate songs. This is something that warrants much further exploration and implementation. In short, I hope that today's hearings result in a dramatic reassessment by media companies as to their overall responsibility and as to the criteria they use to select what they choose to promote and to air. I want to again commend Jim and Rush for calling this hearing, and I thank our witnesses for joining us here today. The gentlelady from California is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your holding this hearing today on this very important topic. As you know, I have a connection to and an affinity for the in entertainment industry. But as a mother and as a member of Congress, I also have concerns about some of the entertainment products that are delivered to our families in the form of games, television shows, movies, and music. As a result, I believe the industry has a responsibility to provide parents with easily identifiable information and access to the best technology available so they as parents can decide what is seen in their household. In many respects, the industry is addressing its responsibility through available technologies and parental notifications. It seems to me, though, that the true challenge is continuously connecting parents to this information. For that reason, I am pleased that you have convened this hearing. It is important that the subcommittee be a part of the national conversation about whether artistic expression can go too far and what too far is. Or said another way, whether there are additional actions that entertainers and industry should consider in order to ensure that they can continue to innovate, freely express themselves, and provide ample notice to consumers, particularly parents, about the products being sold. Of course, this debate has been going on for as long as, it, as long as there has been music, or even teenagers for that matter. I remember a while back, after controversial appearance by two live crew, a conservative Republican senator from Florida made news and turned heads when he said, quote, under our form of freedom of speech, words are protected. Once we begin selectively defining which words are acceptable, we enter a slippery slope where freedom is compromised, close quote. And that senator had it exactly right. Last night when I was reviewing the panel's testimony, I was pleased to see that some of you made similar points. I was also pleased to notice that you all seem to take this issue seriously and to take your responsibilities just as seriously. Our founders understood that we are healthier as a nation if we don't silence words that offend or provoke, but instead use them to encourage the very dialogues and discussions like we're having today. I share this belief, and I'm glad you are all engaged in the dialogue with us, with your colleagues throughout the entertainment industry, and most importantly, with parents. I'd like to thank our panelists for being here today. Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Chair, thanks to the lady. I'm just going to take uh, prerogative right now. There are two people in the audience that I really have to recognize. One is 
my friend, my leader, uh, Mr. Dick Gregory. Uh, he's in the audience.